Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Christine Pambianchi, Senior Vice President of Human Resources at Fortune 500 company Corning. In this role, Christine is responsible for advising the leadership team and overseeing all HR programs and policies for the 45,000 employees in this $10 billion company that has offices located around the world. Christy, thank you very much for joining us here today. It's a great treat, and we love learning from you and hearing about what's going on at Corning. One of the things that Corning is really well known for is having created a super inclusive environment. Can you share with us a little bit about how, that, how you've gone about doing that and what that means for you? Thanks, uh, and it's great to be here. I always love the opportunity to come and uh, partner with uh, universities and, and great research professors, so thanks for having me. Corning, actually this year is celebrating our 50th year of diversity and inclusion programming. So as we began to look back at the history of uh, what we had done back then and what we're doing now, it's been an exciting journey. We're planning a big milestone event this fall to celebrate it. The essence of what we do is research and so uh, we invent materials and then we invent manufacturing assets to make the materials we've invented and so to do our work well we need to be able to have lots of people be able to collaborate um, debate with each other not get groupthink and be able to continue to innovate um, and not get the innovators dilemma so for us inclusion and being able to get the best talent that's out there to come work for us and be able to bring their whole self to work bring all their ideas into the work team is really important and so we have a really strong business case for why we need to be able to do it. And then over the years, uh, we've, we've uh, attacked different areas. You know, first we started, uh, I would say our earliest efforts in the 80s and such were really focused on uh, bringing racial diversity into the workplace and tapping into all the markets that were untapped here in the United States. I think in the 90s, uh, began to get progressive around issues about helping uh, bring women into the workplace, have them be successful, taking on things like daycare and uh, leave policies and such. In the 2000s, we globalized pretty significantly. And so we've done work around how do we build global teams? How do we have remote workers? How do we help people cross culturally uh, where there's different norms in people's maybe home culture than we expect at work? And there's some really interesting uh, research going on about how uh, the cultures and the values of your organization can permeate worldwide and sometimes override the values and the culture from someone's home country. So really trying to take advantage of that to see how that can help further uh, our DNI objectives at Corning. And then we've done research to chart sort of what's our next five to ten years look like. Uh, we've tried to be leaders in the um, GLBTQ space. Uh, we've uh, got 100 points on the Human Equality Index for over 12 years, the uh, campaign run by the Human Rights Campaign. Um, and we really uh, use each of these opportunities as a way to bring our employees closer together and have them be comfortable talking about differences and making differences less scary. So we spoke a little bit about pay parity and the importance of that. Do you see that tying into the, your DNI efforts, or is that something totally separate? And can you say a little bit about what pay parity means to you? We have seven values at Corning, and one of our values is the individual. And so under the broad uh, definition of what we mean when we say we value the individual, is we want uh, our employees to achieve their highest uh, professional goals that they have for themselves, whatever they may be, so that we then as a company can achieve our goals. And we believe when people can do that, uh, we're all going to win, and we want people to be treated with dignity and respect at work and treat each other the way they want to be treated. And we kind of view in that, um, making sure we have a workforce that's representative of the available talent pools and that people can advance in the company fairly uh, on the merits of their work. And then we also include in that, we want people to be paid equally for equal work. And we've set about over the last four or five years to improve the way we measure that and uh, confirm that we have achieved 100% uh, pay equity for people in like roles. And so that's a big milestone that we achieved uh, in 2017. And we're taking that work now to our, all of our international locations. So 100% is, is really remarkable. Can you, and we talked a little bit about lunch about why 99.5% was not good enough, was not good enough, even though many people might argue that it is. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think getting to that 100% is really important for HR professionals? I think that, you know, 
pay uh, equality um, as a standard was legislated many years ago. And I think the tools for how to manage it and the compensation systems haven't uh, evolved to make that easy for companies to understand where they are. I think most companies have good value sets and have a good desire to be employers of choice and treat their employees well. And when you look into people in similar roles and you do expect some job related drivers of pay differences such as performance or uh, experience, um, degrees that have been achieved, etc. So when you consider those factors and you account for those, what's left should leave you with 100% uh, pay equity. And so we, we felt we would not be satisfied till we got to that level because we were already considering same job and then those key differentiators. And then um, we wanted to also be able to respond to our employees who had asked us about this question that we took it seriously. We have a repeatable process. We run it three to four times a year and that we could confirm to them that we're paying everybody fairly. You've mentioned a couple of times some of the interesting challenges about having such a global firm. And Corning has grown a great deal internationally. Can you share a little bit with us about what those challenges are when you expand so quickly internationally? So we had a pretty strong uh, presence in the United States and in Europe uh, throughout the history of the company. And starting in 2000, we started to expand into Asia. Um, and with the uh, uptake in liquid crystal display, flat glass televisions, the telecom market in Asia, and other products that we sell, uh, we started to see a pretty big expansion there. So some of the big challenges going into new regions of the world, first is, you know, uh, who are gonna be your leaders? in those regions and then how are you going to bring the capability online often for us going into a region means bringing in manufacturing capability so that we can serve customers in those markets and in order to do that we need to do technology knowledge transfer protect our intellectual property etc so over time we developed a model where we uh, maybe have a front team that goes in that are leaders that really represent corning the culture, the history, the values, and then also understand that technology. And so those the individuals then become key because they then hire, develop, and groom the local talent that we want to bring up in that particular country or market and then eventually leave uh, to run our business in those markets. And so really paying close attention to those first couple of hires in a country. Usually it's your plant or your office uh, sales manager and your HR leader are often two or three of the first hires that you make in a country or in a region. And getting that first hire right, we found is the key differentiator for how well an operation will evolve over time in a region or not. And is that getting those people right? Is that really what is ensuring that you keep the Corning culture spreading around the world? Yeah, for us, uh, we feel that 165 year old institution and our mission is to invent life-changing technologies. We invented the um, glass uh, bulb encasement for Thomas Edison's light bulb, all the way through to Pyrex, to the catalytic converter substrates that have cleaned the environment, to optical fiber, to some life-changing things we're working on now. So we really uh, get very excited about that mission and we wanna keep carrying on that mission. And so in our culture, our employees uh, put the value of the mission ahead of uh, of each of us as individuals. And so we for sure want to carry that culture on. So can you go talk to us a little bit more about the culture aspect, both just preserving it when you've had this much growth and how it works internationally. And specifically, we, we've we talked a little bit about uh, some of the challenges of what's going on, of knowing really what's going on with the culture, mm -hmm. even at levels that you may not have direct right. access to seeing. Can you share with us some of those challenges and yeah. how you address them? Yeah, so what's exciting is we're a global company. We operate in over 30 countries around the world in 12 to 14 languages. Um, but at the same time, we're a small company. We have about 200 executives that run the company worldwide and, and scaling to 46,000 people. So one, the, the values and the culture help create sort of a code of conduct. How do we want to behave? Because if you only have 200 executives and you have 46,000 employees, every employee needs to kind of decide how are they going to behave in the workplace and how are they going to try to uphold Corning's mission and uh, help treat the, uh, the culture that we have uh, inside the company. And so for us, we really invest in that because it's key to keeping the, the company alive. I think as we 
um, have expanded, you, you know, leaders can't know what's going on everywhere all the time. So you want to get to a spot where people have a good understanding of the values, the code of conduct, and um, can hold each other accountable because it's their company. And we want our employees to feel as much ownership of the product, of the customer, of the environment as leadership does. And so we um, have you know, tools uh, like web pages, videos, testimonials, um, communication meeting guides, reward systems, so people can actually talk about the culture and uh, recognize it and work through cases, like what a certain thing in a certain culture might mean, might mean something different in another. In our company's uh, business model, we have a very consensus-driven decision-making model. Some of it's because we want to invite in many opinions and we want to make sure that we're uh, challenging our ideas, challenging our technologies, challenging what might be ways in which we're vulnerable. Um, and so we invite that uh, consensus in. At the same time, the downside of that is sometimes in our culture we can be too polite then and maybe not give people feedback or call people out on uh, when they maybe have um, done something that isn't exactly fitting with the culture or maybe could have been a higher level of performance. And so that could be our Achilles heel. And so we have to work hard to have a really strong sensing function of first line supervisors, HR leaders and the businesses to make it safe for people to come forward and say, hey, I don't think that meeting went the way I would have wanted it to go if I were truly living our values. And we're working hard and we're going to be out uh, this year doing some discussions and seminars about why is that so important to uh, remind people and give them uh, safe channels to come forward with criticism, whether it's criticism of leadership, criticism of uh, things going on in the company, in the markets, with the products. Um, because oftentimes uh, employees have really great ideas and if you close those off, problems can fester, they can get away from you, and then they can become much bigger problems. Than, uh, than they would have originally been if, if that person was free to come forward and give you that feedback. So is that a role of HR? Is that one of the critical responsibilities that you think that HR has to set that example and create that environment that makes it possible for employees to really share what's going on throughout the organization? So I absolutely believe it is. And I talked to the HR team at Corning that uh, we really have three roles and three constituents that we serve. We serve the enterprise. So we need to be the function that brings to bear all of the mechanisms so that we can hire and employ people in the markets we operate around the world and keep, you know, and, and mitigate any risk associated with employment. Second, we serve leadership, so we help them make sure they have the talent that they need, the organizational designs for effectiveness, um, work through uh, business and then talent-related strategies, et cetera, so business results can be achieved. And I think the third constituent is the employee base. And we need to be you know, guardians of the culture, of the values. We need to be accessible to employees to uh, be a source for Q&A, help them sort through uh, if they have concerns or just figuring out ways that they can be evolving their career to better achieve their goals and also achieve the company's goals. And I think over the last, um, you know, I've been doing this for 28 years now, uh, the last, I would say, 15 some odd years, I've seen a continuous erosion of emphasis and value on the third constituent base. And a lot of emphasis on, I want to get to the C-suite and serve the enterprise and the board. I want to work on business teams and be a seat at the table and work on business issues. And then not a lot of dialogue around what good employee relations looks like every day, what good positive work environments look like. And I feel very strongly that this is a critical function HR and HR managers play. And I've talked openly with the HR team at Corning that um, it's not okay at Corning to do two of the three or one of the three. You have to do all three. And I've also indicated to folks if that's not what they want to do, that's okay too. Um, but they can't do an HR in the HR department at Corning. And I'll help them find an HR department that's fitting with their skills and what they want to do. And I think that there's a big call to action right now for HR functions. And I think in a lot of ways, and I'm sure in some places in Corning, you know, we've failed employees and we've lost their trust or our firms, brands and reputations have been damaged because we lost the handle on some things that have hurt a company publicly. And I think HR needs to really uh, do some introspection on how do we value that and how do we bring back that expertise. So that's really interesting, to, the emphasis on all three stakeholders that way. 
and it, certainly over the last decade or so, companies, ha it seems that people have kind of forgotten about the employees. We have focused much more on external constituents. Do you see a competitive advantage and a real means for competing better in the marketplace by taking care of that third constituency, which in this case are employees? I do, and I, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, we have, uh, worldwide we have over 70 manufacturing facilities. We've always held that we would have an HR uh, presence at every manufacturing plant. We would never go lights out and have a, you know, a, a phone it in, call it in, chat bot it in for your HR support at the plant level. So we've always had uh, on the ground HR uh, support at the plants, typically in the form of an HR uh, plant level manager. And my expectations of those folks are that they know the employees, that they're uh, good stewards on the plant staff, and they're good sensing uh, mechanisms for where do we have good uh, employee relations and what do we need to do to be continuing to improve it. And similarly, we have it in the other uh, functional areas, commercial, research, etc. And I think um, for companies that have continued to have that investment, um, for employees, they now know, okay, there's one place I could go for at least pointing me in the right direction. And typically there's about one HR employee for about 150 employees. So uh, the scale of what an individual HR manager can do in that construct that I have is still limited, um, but it's greater than if there was no presence. And a plant manager or shift supervisors have someone they can go to to also just sort of bounce ideas off of, of this happened to me with one of my employees on my shift or on my work team or this engineer. Here's how I'm thinking about handling it what do you think and in the moment if you're not there or you've gone lights out you probably only get 10% of those calls and then the other 90 are going with you know sort of managers doing their best um, but you you lose something and one of the things I've heard you talk about in regards to really having HR be its best is having that trust with employees and and leadership and uh, all the way around. And regarding trust, one of the things I've heard you said that I find really interesting is the need to be willing to admit mistakes or where there are challenges or where you're not yet perfect. Can you share a little bit about that philosophy? Yeah. I think trust is so important and it's so hard to earn and it's so easy to lose. So uh, when I was early in my career working in, in plants, uh, I would often try to at least once a month go out on a shift so I really understood what the work was. And that would give me some credibility with the workers uh, in the plant, but also with management, because then they would know I took the time to care about what that work was. So these are little ways to build trust. Another way to build trust is admit your mistakes. And I think uh, most of us are overachievers and we're raised uh, you know, wanting to do good, wanting to please, wanting to achieve the tasks ahead of us. And so it's a little bit scary to stand up and say, you know what, I screwed that up. That wasn't my best, but I'm gonna do a root cause and I'm gonna make sure it doesn't happen again. Or at least I know what are gonna be the triggers and maybe I'm gonna put some guardrails on so I have some guidance and warning systems before it happens again. And um, you know, it, it probably took me uh, till about the you know, seventh to 10th year of my experience curve to feel confident enough to say, you know what, I, that, I kinda of screwed that up, I'm gonna fix it. And I'm gonna need your help to fix it. And and what do you say to people that are that often say they don't they are afraid from the corporate perspective to admit places where they're not really strong because of fear of lawsuits or just right. the fear of the what the lawyers might say? One of the things I've I've admired uh, during my 18 years at Corning is uh, how open and transparent we are with the workforce. So we openly talk about what's our mission, and then each year we lay out for the whole workforce. Here's our whole plan for the year, and we try to make it such that every employee can see where does their work tie into the overall plan. Um, and then because of the nature of innovation um, and the fact that the businesses that we're in, we typically invent a material that becomes an industry. We typically have one or two competitors, and then eventually that industry may subside or be replaced by something else, and so the longer we can run the businesses, the better. But we have to constantly be reinventing ourselves, And so that puts you in this mode of, I have to be willing to be self-critical or I'll probably be extinct. And so that makes it safe from a, our business survival model, so then we sort of then begin to apply that to our own selves. And one of the things I, I, I continue to hope, and I think this has been an age-long issue inside of you know, OB and, and OD uh, offerings is um, you know, sort of the idea of development plans. And I'd like to get to a place where people were proud of and talked about, you know, here's the two new things I'm going to learn this year. 
because you're never good at everything. And we, I, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in 21. You know, I'm 49, I'll be 50 this year. I guarantee I didn't learn everything I needed to know by 21. And it should be safe to say, you know what, I'm really gonna, this is this new thing I'm gonna work on. And I'm getting people excited about and taking on and instead of being ashamed of things they're not good at. And so I also get excited about, you know, I may not live to be 100, my kids probably will. So when you start thinking about 50 year careers, you must be a constant learner. And you gotta kind of be, you know, college freshman for life. Where I wanna take a course in that, I wanna take a course in this. And so, you know, my, my parents worked 30 years, I'm already, I've worked 28 years at 49, I'll probably work at least 40 years, my kids will probably work 50. So I also think evolving some of the, these environmental or HR capabilities and tools uh, may help workers achieve longer and more enriching uh, work lives. Christy, thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure for us to have you here on campus, and we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you. You just listened to another CHRO Conversation. Today, Christine shared her views regarding how talent drives business strategy and success around the world. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us.